Hey, and welcome back everyone to our weekly streams, um, which we had, well, paused for two weeks. Um, anyway, so here we are, and we're working on RISC-V platforms, and especially we want to write open source homework for it, uh, and we want to write that in Rust, and that is the Orboot project, um, which we've been talking about here for quite a while now. So today, uh, we're actually going to do something a bit different. And as you may uh, see, if you've uh, seen the previous streams also, uh, the decoration has changed a bit here. Um, so I've added a few stars just there, right below me. And further below the stars, there are two new mascots now. Um, you may recognize them. So there is uh, the bunny, which is named Glenda. And Glenda is the mascot of the Plan 9 research operating system. And next to Glenda, we have the gopher that you may know from the Go programming language. And if you don't know either of them, and you're asking yourself why we're actually talking about Go here now, um, let me actually show you very quickly a few things. So uh, the Golang gopher, if you just search for it, um, has a bit of history. And that is actually common history with Glenda. So yeah, the Go Gopher uh, here on the blog. So if you go to go.dev slash blog slash gopher, um, <laughs> actually stems from a book that has been made for children. And the person who drew it was Rene French, uh, the wife of Rob Pike. And Rob Pike is one of the uh, people who have been involved uh, in and also designed the Plan 9 operating system and also the Go programming language. So yeah, now you know where the mascots come from. So yeah, this here is Glenda. And if you uh, look at this here, you also already uh, recognize the Gopher. So these are different characters from the same uh, book that had been made for children. And so yeah, here we go, the Go Gopher. And why am I telling you about this? So um, today we're uh, actually not going to write any code in Rust, um, but we still want to look at our Rust-V platforms um, to just get a bit of a different view now. So yeah, I already gave a very brief introduction to CPU last time, so I don't want to repeat too much. Um, but just, just for summary, so the uh, CPU concept that comes from the Plan 9 operating system is the idea that you can just use, you know, any uh, any device, any system on your network. Well, it should be a system supporting it. Um, anyway, you, you could also just use it uh, as if it was your local system. So you could just um, sort of extend your system to uh, whatever you have. So now you may think, okay, well, that sounds like internet to me. Um, it, it sort of is, so it's based on a network concept. But the uh, core idea is, and th that's different from, you know, any other uh, broader concept now, is that you can use the CPU of a, repo of a remote machine as if it was your CPU locally. So, you, you know, imagine you're just grabbing a CPU, and now you can use it and do whatever you want with it. Um, so if you think like, okay, this is a bit like if I was spinning up a virtual machine in the cloud, um, it's not even that far away from it, uh, but conceptually a bit different. So uh, the, the core difference would be um, that usually when you uh, set up a virtual machine in a cloud, um, you, you would you know, somehow provision it. You would install an operating system or you know, um, just get a pre-built image for it. So usually the cloud providers offer you that. Um, but uh, what we want to do is, and instead of then connecting to that, um, and doing something on the remote side, uh, we just want to use our local tools and just have uh, the load actually happening on the remote machine. So how does this even work? Um, so this is the CPU command now uh, that we have in the Euro project. We have some brief documentation on that also uh, here in the readme. Um, so what we are going to do is we're just going to write something like here. We're going to say CPU, the name of a remote machine, um, and then whatever command we want to use. 
And yeah, that, that's, uh, that's actually it already. Um, now this might be a bit confusing at first. So yeah, we will uh, go quite slow on that for a start. Now we'll also introduce a, a few more tools that we're uh, going to use you know, around all of this. Um, and our eventual goal is uh, we want to see a bit the RISC-V platform's so-called CSRs now. And the CSRs are uh, some special registers. So, well, S is not uh, short for special. Um, these are the control and status registers. So if you know the x86 platforms, there is something similar. Uh, it's called MSR. So on an x86 machine, um, let's maybe have a look at that very quickly. So if I look at my slash dev slash CPU, whatever number, and now you see CPU again. Um, so here I have eight CPU cores, right? So the cores are listed as if they were different CPUs. Well, let's look at one of them. I have this file here, which is called MSR. And what are MSRs? So MSRs are the model specific registers on the x86 platform. Um, they tell you very specific details about the platform. Uh, it might be that some registers are only present for uh, specific platforms, or you know, they may, they may have a very specific meaning to um, some, you know, let's say some uh, certain CPU family. Um, like, you know, not x86 as a family, but uh, um, a more like a generation. Uh, but there are also registers which are, you know, among all the x86s from, from a certain uh, point of time on where, you know, specific features were introduced, and those were retained over time. Um, so, yeah, you, you may know something um, similar that I'm, uh, uh, similar to what I'm talking about here. If you look at your uh, slash proc slash CPU info, CPU again, um, <laughs> there you can see all the features that your CPU has, right? So like FPU, the uh, float, uh, float processing unit, whatever, um, VME, uh, I, I guess this is like virtual memory something. I'm not actually too sure even. So there are tons of things in here um, that you can look at. And yeah, some of them uh, might be familiar to you if you had to mess with virtual machines, for example, then you had to watch out that, um, you know, uh, some special extensions uh, were available here, uh, or sometimes you, you know, you would need to activate them first in the firmware menu. Uh, at least that was the case back like 10 years ago. It's a bit different now. So nowadays it's, I guess, usually on by default. Some um, operating systems are also making uh, use of that essentially. Um, like Windows, for example, when you run the system, uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux, you would also have a Linux uh, kernel running and that runs under the Windows hypervisor. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, this is the uh, features that are in the CPU that you can read from here. Um, and you can read out, you know, quite a bunch of these here uh, from the MSRs. So we're going to do something very similar. And we're going to do this now on our RISC-V system. So um, how do we go about this? So first of all, um, in the last stream, um, I tried to get something to work, um, you know, where we could actually boot through from uh, our own uh, re-implementation that we have in Orboot uh, for the very, very first hardware initialization bits. Then we would load the DRAM, you know, get through that then we would end up in a U-boot environment and that in turn uh, would then spin up uh, the open SBI, um, the supervisor binary interface implementation, like the one written in C. Um, and then from there on, we would actually continue uh, into the operating system. I actually just swapped a bit. So yeah, be before, um, be before open SBI, we would, uh, no, before <laughs> U-boot, we would be in, Open SPI, and then you would eventually, you know, we would be able to load our operating system like a Linux kernel, for example. So, um, yeah, we didn't really get to the very point where we had everything running, uh, but yeah, I haven't just been sleeping in the meantime. Um, I have already uh, built a Linux kernel for the Vision 5 board that we're working with, and I have also uh, built an image 
uh, for a uroot system. So a uroot is uh, a root file system essentially, and also build tools around a root file system uh, that we then just put into the Linux kernel as the so-called init RAM file system. So when the kernel comes up, we already have this uh, full environment with a lot of uh, command line utilities. And now one of them uh, would be CPU D, the CPU daemon, which is now uh, listening for a CPU connection so that I can just CPU into the machine. And we will boot this over the network and I've also set this up already. So what I'm just going to do is um, I'm going to run a tool now. It's called Center. Um, Center comes uh, from also the Plan 9 uh, environment, if you will. So yeah, it's been ported around um, and now we have it in the Harvey uh, operating system project. So Harvey OS is also a Plan 9 operating system. And here we have a bunch of tools written in Go, uh, including Center. Um, and this is how I'm going to serve uh, a local directory here, uh, which includes a Linux kernel image that would then be uh, booted automatically. Um, yeah, let me quickly show you. So you see there is this switch here, tftp dir, uh, the current directory. Uh, let's actually have a look at the current directory. So the current directory uh, contains a uh, image which is called mImage. Uh, you can see I also played around a bit at a crashing version, at a version that was booting. Um, eventually I have this version now, uh, yeah, which is uh, yeah somewhere here. Um, so there is a vendor specific fork of Linux. Uh, so there is, um, you know, a, a fork of Linux under the um, star5 org on GitHub. Um, and then we also have the upstream Linux kernel. So that is what you would usually get from kernel.org or, you know, any of the mirrors. Um, yeah, like there is also one on GitHub, for example. Anyway, yeah, I had to iterate a bit. Um, eventually I got to uh, build and run one of those kernels here uh, properly. And that's what we're now just going to run. So we just take it for granted. Um, if we have some time later and somebody here uh, comes with a question, I can also briefly show you uh, yeah, how I got to building that kernel and so on. Anyway, so yeah, we're now going to fire up Center. Uh, Center is going to serve us two purposes. One of them is, um, well, DHCP not in this instance because um, yeah, we're not, um, we're not using it for that pr uh, purpose. Uh, but we're going to use it for, uh, actually, I think it, it does, uh, it does serve DHCP. Yeah, maybe the message is misleading, whatever. Anyway, uh, but the core thing we're going to use it for is uh, TFTP. So when I now boot up the uh, Vision 5 board, you will see um, now here on the right hand side, our bootloader, <laughs> modified bootloader. Um, we just did the DRAM in it. Now we run into OpenSPI. Uh, that just ran and now we end up in uBoot and uBoot is now loading a uh, file from the remote side, which was the Linux kernel. Um, yeah, it also tried loading something else. Uh, please don't ask about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure actually where it comes from now. Um, could be something that I had in a config file or maybe it's also hard coded somewhere into uBoot. Um, anyway, but the image it was pulling was, um, oh yeah, look, pixie links that uh, it could be that there is an entry there for this uh, other image. Um, yeah, it was pulling some image file. Let's actually see which one. Uh, that should be somewhere here in the log. Let's just search for image, 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 image. Huh. Maybe, maybe it was actually searching for upstream or vendor, uh, vendor, huh, or maybe not. Um, yeah, do we have that here actually? Let's have a quick look again. So yeah, I just, um, I just saved that to the uBoot environment so it would happen automatically. Um, yeah, we were, we were just requesting the file M image so yeah, M image. It's um, not just the file name, but it's also a uh, you know like like a sort of image um, that comes from the uBoot project. So it's like you know you have this image, and then also part of the image is the 
uh, DTB, which tells the kernel um, what actually you have uh, on the hardware. It's uh, short for device tree blob. Um, you know, that's a description of the hardware that you have and so on. Anyway, so yeah, that is now happily running here. Um, we can we can just type commands here, right? So this is now our uh, serial console that we have through the USB serial adapter. So I can say like ls, for example. Um, yeah, don't, don't mind this uh, warning message here. Uh, that is also like, uh, something we can neglect. Um, but we are running CPU D now. So yeah, we, we don't actually need to do anything here anymore. We cannot happily do anything over the network. And that brings us to um, this here. I have prepared this small script. Uh, I just call it CPU vision 5.sh. It's really just for convenience. So what it does is it runs the CPU command. So I have a local build of that command. Um, I give it a namespace. So now everything that is in my home directory is also available in slash home uh, when I connect to the remote side. So that's what I talked about earlier, right? So my local files uh, would be just available for use with the remote CPU. Um, I'm using my SSH key for, you know, that's how we actually establish the connection. Um, and then, yeah, I just use the network name of the remote. So I have an entry in my Etsy host file, uh, which has the IP address of the vision five. So, you know, I could also just say, uh, we ping vision, vision five, right? So that works. Um, this is the address we gave it. Uh, and now if we look at what is actually running there, well, there is, there is already some pre, uh, paired command. Um, yeah, we, we should check for one port and that port is, uh, we actually just um, got it recently uh, approved uh, 17010. You know, there is an organization which is assigning ports to projects, right? So if you connect to a machine using a specific port, you can uh, pretty much expect the protocol to be present there. Like port 80 for HTTP, for example, is a common thing. And now we have 17010 for CPU. And as you can see, um, the port is open. It's listening for TCP connections. So wh what happens when we now run our CPU script? So the first thing I want to do now is I want to run the cat command and I want to look at the uh, temperature of thermal zone zero. So this is like, you know, the um, temperature sensor uh, within the SLC. Um, yeah, so the uh, processor essentially on the board that we have. So what I could do now is I could go here. I could write uh, slash bbin slash cat. That's the path to the cat binary. Um, I could also just type cat for convenience, but yeah, that's not the point. Let's use the full path now for the sake of the example. Now we get a value out of it. So this is the current temperature um, in Celsius. Uh, times 1000. So yeah, it's actually 45 Celsius or, you know, uh, 46 somehow. Um, yeah, we can run it a few times. We also see the temperature is changing over time. So it looks like the uh, sensor is uh, somehow working at least. Um, yeah, and you can see it's, uh, yeah, it's not very cool even uh, not being on load here. Um, yeah, so what I have on it is, um, I don't have an active cooler. Uh, but a passive heat sink, right? So I can I can put my finger on that. It's uh, it's okay now. I attached it there because I didn't want to have a running fan. It can be especially annoying because it, you know it has a like high frequency sound. It's not very great for doing video streams here. Anyway, um, yeah. So now let's do the same thing uh, and use the CPU command. So yeah, I'm now running CPU, and you can see we're actually doing the very same thing now. Um, we're also reading out the temperature. So it's like we're using the command slash bbin slash cat and then looking at this file here. Now you might say, hang on, that's just like when I'm using SSH, I can also do this. So we're now going to do something um, which is a bit different from using SSH. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the ls command. So what happens when you run the ls command? You get a listing of the files in your current directory, right? So what is my current directory? So my current directory here um, 
is this year the Beagle 5 directory in, well, in, in my uh, local copy of Orboot. Let's have a quick look at the full path here. So I'm in my home directory, firmware Orboot source mainboard, seed Beagle 5. So this is where I am. And now when I ls here, well, I get this here, right? So I have these files, build.rs, flash.sh, run.sh, and so on. And I'm, I'm not reading all of them, just, you know. Anyway, so we're now going to run the same command on the vision 5. What do we expect? Well, we get a listing of our local directory because we are currently in this directory. Um, but now you might say, wait, how does this work? Because on the remote machine, so we're using the CPU on the remote machine, but we're seeing our local files here. Yes, we do. So what happens is underneath, um, you can think of an automated mount. So what is happening is it's like mounting the current local file system to the remote. And now when code is running on the remote, it's running in an, an environment where the current directory is now the same as my local current directory. So instead of running um, this ls command here with that path, I can also use my full path that I have here, right? So I can also say, uh, I want to use this here and I get the same result again. And yeah, of course that works with, you know, any subdirectory. Um, I could also use tilde for example, or let's say tilde min so you can see what uh, binaries I have. And lo and behold, um, it might take a while sometimes, you know, it's running over the network after all. Um, yeah, here we go. So these are the files I actually have in my uh, local bin directory. So yeah, center being one of them. So that's the command we were running on top, right? So yeah, we, we can actually also see if center is in there. Um, yeah, indeed it is, of course. So uh, that is one experiment. Now, the other thing is, um, besides, I mean, seeing my, my files on the remote side is maybe not uh, that interesting, uh, but it also means I can use any of my local applications on the remote side. Now, of course, there is one caveat to that. It also has to fit the uh, remote's operating system and architecture, right? So I would need to cross compile a bit. Um, so there is a project I made. Um, I well, started, you know, with a stupid hello world program, just, you know, like everywhere where you just print hello world, it's not very uh, fancy. And then I extended that a bit. So first of all, um, yeah, I wanted to target uh, the operating systems environment a, a bit. And in this instance, we're specifically looking at Linux because that's you know what we have on my local system here and also running on the Vision 5 now. Um, and I also uh, started targeting um, the RISC 5 architecture specifically. So yeah, let's look here. Um, <laughs> The repository's name is actually Hello Linux RV64 RS. So, yeah, at, at this point, uh, we might actually remove the RV64. Well, I don't really care too much right now uh, because it's just a demo tool anyway. Um, yeah, so, yeah, now this is a Rust program again. Um, so, we're doing a bit of Rust here now. And uh, this allows for uh, reading out the um, registers, so the CSRs, that we can access as a regular user. So I'm going to run this program now uh, using the CPU Vision 5 tool, um, you know, this uh, wrapping script. And yeah, I've already built this program, so yeah, I'm just going to run this on uh, target RISC-564 and known Linux GNU. Um, yeah, just as you, you know, would usually also find a, a Rust program in this directory. So what is going to happen there? Um, so first of all, it's printing. Let's have a look at your shiny RISC-V system. Uh, that is happening. And then we are printing a few registers. One of them is called FCSR. Uh, one is called cycle and one is called time. More on that in a bit. Um, yeah, just uh, you know, for the sake of completeness, I'm also reading out CPU information. Uh, like RV64, IMA, FTC, uh, that is our specific subset of the instruction set, right? So we are in a 64-bit RISC-V system 
we can use integers, we can do multiplication, we have atomics, we have float and double at hand, and also C, and the C extension is for the CSRs, if I remember correctly. Or it might have been something else. I don't know. Uh, whatever, that's the thing you can look up on Wikipedia. Um, yeah, we have an MMU uh, with 39 bits of uh, size. Yeah, so that allows for uh, addressing a lot of memory. Now, if we look at this, um, this is the memory size available. So yeah, we have eight gigabytes on that board, um, plenty of memory. And this is the command line that was given to the Linux kernel. Yeah, it's a 519 kernel. So this is RC7. As you may know, uh, 519 has just been released recently. So we could rebase onto that. And I think that might even be an upstream kernel anyway, uh, which is nice. Yeah, I, I, I forgot which one it was. But anyway, it's not too important here. So yeah, let's now look at the interesting bits. So these up here, the CSRs. So um, there is a uh, specification for RISC V, the so-called privileged uh, specification. And that's what I also had open here initially. And in this privileged specification, so you can you know find it in different revisions on RISC-V.org. If you Google for it, you also find it in uh, you know different uh, other websites. There is like also HTML versions and so on, which might be a bit nicer to read than the PDF here. Um, yeah, I mean this here has a nice index at least. Anyway, so yeah, let's look at the listing here. So these are the CSRs that we could read as a user. Uh, one of them is cycle. Uh, cycle is C00. Um, another one is time, and then we have a few more. And to understand what we're uh, doing here, actually, um, let's have a bit of a look at our code side by side with this listing. So we put the listing here on the left. Uh, can we hide this? Yes, we can. Yeah, web browsers are not the greatest PDF viewers. Um, that's just what I had at hand here. So yeah, what we're also going to do here now is uh, we're going to close Minicom because we don't really need it. Um, that makes it easier for us to write things here now. And also make this up here a bit smaller. Um, yeah, and then uh, look at our code here. So yeah, I recently also switched to <laughs> NeoVim. Um, anyway, so this here is what we're doing. Uh, we're reading the FCSR register, the cycle, and the time register. So these are the ones we just looked at, cycle, uh, and well, time is here. And then there is this one, FCSR, floating point control and status register. And what did we get when we read this register? Um, let's maybe just uh, run this again and uh, Yeah, have a look at this side by side. And because it's getting a bit much, um, let's actually comment out everything else. So yeah, I'm currently not really interested in the CPU info and so on. So we just comment this out. Uh, we already know what kernel, etc., is running. So we're just using this here now to hack into uh, as a demo project, if you will. Um, yeah, so now we need to rebuild this. How do we build this? Um, well, do we have a makefile? Yes, I have actually bothered writing a makefile. Uh, I will just say make, make risk five. Hey, let's make risk five. So yeah, this will give us a fresh build. And now we can CPU again. And here we go. So yeah, FCSR. So yeah, if we were using floats, um, this might be changing a bit in the process. And now, well, I have no clue how this actually works or behaves. Um, so let, let's see what actually happens if we do some float operations around this. So let's say uh, we have a we have a float. Okay, let's say uh, let float, our float is now called float. Um, let's say it's 42.23 or two, three. So this is now our float. I don't know what we're going to do with this. 
whatever. Let's say let's say we're doing an addition or a multiplication. Let's do a multiplication. Um, that to be uh, float times I don't know what 1.337 or something. Um, and so in addition to everything else, uh, we're also going to print foo. And we know foo is some some sort of float addition. Uh, well, mu sorry, multiplication, right? So it could be something like, I don't know, 45, 46, 47. Well, actually a bit more, 50 something, whatever. So yeah, we're going to run this again. So we're going to rebuild this and then rerun this. And because we're lazy, we're doing this here. Now we have one liner to run. Okay, and the FCSR bits did not really change. So yeah, apparently doing float operations doesn't really impact those registers um, afterwards. Uh, maybe, maybe that would happen. Um, if we did something like reading the FCSR registers uh, during one of those operations. Well, whatever that would mean, I don't know. Like, you know, if we would write some assembly, we could, you know, load a float value somewhere in the register uh, and then look at that. I don't know. Anyway, we're not going to look at this too much in detail anyway. Um, yeah, there is also a comment on here. Uh, this is essentially a summary of those previous two registers as it appears. Um, let's see. Oh, accrued exceptions and dynamic rounding mode. And it's actually a read writable register. Okay. And we got this value here, five, six. So can we can we fool around with this? Can we change this CSR? Can we do like, I don't know, FCSR, FCSR, right? Uh-oh. I, I guess we can't write to this. What does Rust say about it? Uh, Rust is not unhappy about this yet. How does this work? Do we get this here? Can we do like, whatever it's called here, like a Lambda or whatever it's called in other languages. Um, let's quickly have a look at the RISC-V crate, which I recently forked because I had, a f I had to fix something in it. Um, <laughs> Some more RISC-V, RISC-V RS. So uh, what are we going to look for? We're looking for FCSR. So the resource register FCSR. So is there a write function? There is a write function. And well, this here is a macro and this what this macro in, uh, essentially does is, uh, I think it, it creates more functions for us or something. Let's see, there is, oh, look at this here. We can say set rounding mode. Okay, so we can change the rounding mode um, and clear flags, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, there is something on flags here. Okay, so let's change the rounding mode, actually. I don't even know what rounding modes are available, but I guess we will find out by looking at this here. Oh, look. Round to nearest even. Round down, round up. Okay. Let's say we're going to round down. So remember, we got 56 something. Um, so yeah, instead of writing to register directly, let's say we're going to set set rounding mode. What was it? Set rounding mode. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, awesome auto completion almost works. So what do we need to use here? Risk five? Is it risk five register? Uh, FCSR, and then rounding mode. Rounding mode. Look, I don't even know. Uh, need to use what I pasted. So, yeah, we're go just going to say it round down. Um, and we're going to do another operation, and we're going to say let bar be our beautiful float again, 
Uh, we're going to do the same multiplication. And yeah, I guess we will also see the FCSR register changed then. Right? And we're going to print bar. Uh, let's actually do this here because it works, I think. Uh oh, no, risk five something uh, is unsafe. So, yeah, if, if you hear about safety in Rust, unsafe Rust is the best Rust. So, here, here is the thing um, this is an operation. So what we're doing here is that rounding mode is writing to a register uh, and writing to just arbitrary registers is essentially unsafe. Um, but the whole point of a crate like the RISC-V crate here is that we would gain safety um, by having the unsafety encapsulated uh, in the function that we're calling. Um, apparently that's not the case, so yeah, whatever. Now I'm just realizing we can write this shorter because uh, yeah, I've imported FCSR up here. We're saying use FCSR. Okay, so uh, we're going to do this again. And lo and behold, um, we're still getting the same value. How does that work? So first of all, um, to make this a bit simpler and readable for us, uh, let's do this here. So it becomes a bit shorter. So uh, we also want to see bar, but we don't need to pass those values explicitly. Nice. Uh-oh, it's not, it's not happy about it. FCSR cannot be formatted with a, okay. Yeah, um, can we do something like, what was it? So, uh, usually we would have something like, you know, colon, question mark, something, whatever it was before. I cannot uh, even remember all of this here. Um, yeah, it's like colon, question mark. Oh, actually, we also have it down here. Um, but how do we do this for, uh, for an existing, does this work? Can we do this? I'm not sure if this works. It might. Oh, look, yeah, it works. Yeah, so this here is the shorthand for writing colon question mark, then comma F back here. Uh, and, you know, have Rust replace this like a, you know, template string or whatever you may know from other languages. But that's not our point here. Uh, we want to see this here rounded. So we just changed the rounding mode. Why do we not? Oh, <laughs> so first of all, um, we're going to read the register after setting that mode now so that we might get a different view here, right? Let's see if that even worked. So yeah, indeed, we can see um, this here changed. So it's now set to 64. Um, what is 64? Let's go to our favorite uh, calculator for doing this sort of stuff. So we're going to use the number 64. We're converting it to a base two string. So we get this here. So we're, we're setting the seventh bit, right? So yeah, 64 is essentially two to the six. Um, we start counting at zero. So yeah, this is the seventh bit. Um, so, but why did the rounding not happen as expected? And why did I accidentally close this? Um, Yeah, no rule to make it. Why does, why does make not continue then? Because everything is fine now. So we don't say end, we, we just say semicolon. Come on, make. 
We we don't. Oh, we actually want your output. Yeah, whatever. Um. Yeah, why does the? Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong directory. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That happens. Okay, now it also works with the end. Okay, so yeah, we're we're getting our sixty four here, uh, but I was expecting to see a different value now in bar. I wanted to see something um, like a rounded value, like fifty six, because we're saying rounding mode round down. So can we provoke? different behavior here uh, what happens if we lose uh, if we just use very very large values like I don't know let's say uh, ridiculous ridiculous let ridiculous ridiculous be this large value whatever it is um, one and a lot of zeros point something uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I should get the auto completion set up at some point in a better way. Uh, let's make this a bit larger, maybe. Great. Okay, so um, this still looks like we're getting the same value twice. And well, another thing we're going to do now is we're going to comment out this year and only print the fancy registers that we actually want. Now we don't really care about C and T here. We can even comment them out. Yeah, this only tells us, uh, you know, how many cycles have already been spent, how long the machine is running and you know I don't even know if this is like milliseconds or something um, anyway yeah so now it, it should be a bit more readable so we should still see our FCSR and then our values okay so rounding doesn't change as we like it so what else can we do um, Let's look a bit at the crate again. Uh, we're not going to use an invalid rounding mode. Um, yeah, let's maybe try rounding to something like uh, nearest even. And maybe, maybe we even have to uh, set some other register or register value somewhere for this to actually work i don't know it's a bit strange so we have f flex we have frm so frm is the rounding mode and f flex is i don't know what those exceptions are huh okay let's let's do something stupid um let's say we divide by zero or something right so I don't know actually what happens in Rust. Can you divide by zero in Rust? Let boop be float divided by zero. Does this work or does the compiler tell you like you cannot divide by zero? Uh-oh. Rust doesn't want to compile uh, divide by zero. No implementation for. Oh. Of course, then we make it a float. Then we make it zero point zero. Great, so that works. Um, apparently, we get infinity, but we don't get any exception. Huh? How unfortunate. Okay, so. Yeah, you know what? I'm pretty much done with the uh, float register now. I don't really care much more about it. Um, I want to look a bit at a few other registers now. So, yeah, the most interesting ones, that's now the problem. The most interesting registers are actually not the user registers. 
So we can look at a few others here now, like, I don't know, EPC or something, uh, interrupt pending, uh, user trap cost. So this is like, you know, when, uh, when we run in, in um, so we, when we run into a trap, then the kernel will say, okay, we need to handle this. Uh, it will return something uh, which will tell us the cause of the trap. And yeah, then we can respond to that again, blah, de blah. Um, that is not very interesting right now. Um, yeah, maybe for the sake of the example, let's actually look at the EPC. So that's like the program counter. Uh, oops. Uh, pressing the wrong keys here. So yeah, let, let's just put this here, UEPC. Uh, let's just call it U and we say that U equals uh, yeah, we just say UEPC dot UEPC read. Um, you might see that I'm also used to other programming languages where instead of colon colon, I would put a period here or, or a dot, whatever you want to call it. Like in JavaScript, for example. Um, anyway, so we need another register. Oh, look, we already have the UEPC register. Um, because I was reading it before. Oh, let's see what happens. Uh, maybe things go horribly wrong now because it's uh-oh, we're not allowed to read our program counter. Yeah, this is what you get uh, when, when you try to do very horrible things. Um, I guess this is not panicking in Rust, or it might be. I don't know, at least we don't see any of the output, right? So the problem uh, is happening here. Um, how do we handle this in Rust? Can we do something like try catch? I don't know. Is there a try catch in Rust? Try catch, try catch Rust. What is the equivalent? Um, yeah, right. So does reading a register or well, this one specifically here, does that give us a result that we could handle? I don't think so, uh, because then we would at least get some output here. So yeah, this just doesn't work. So um, is this not panicking? Do we need a panic handler? Rest panic handler. Panic handler. Ah, uh, we're just going to use the default. So this is for no std environments. We're in a std environment. Um, huh. Does this even work in a, in a std environment? We're going to figure this out. So we're going to use, we're going to use core panic panic info. Uh, we're going to use this panic handler here. We just copy paste things. Um, uh oh. Do we need to add something so that we can do this? Yeah, I guess this won't work with uh, a hosted, like in an operating system running a program just like that. Um, I'm used to doing that in Formware, so I actually uh, would need to do this anyway. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, we're not going, that's also why it's commented out down there. Uh, we're not going to read the uh, program counter. So what else can we possibly look at? We have the performance monitoring counters. We could look at those. Um, we have cycle and time reg so yeah you see those h's here h is for high so in you know in in systems where you have limited registers um and you actually have a value that which is longer than your register size 
But what you can do as a workaround is you can split up your register. So you have a high register and a low register. So yeah, this would be the, um, the upper 32 bits here. Uh, and it says for the RISC-5 32 uh, architectures. So yeah, but we're on a 64 bit system, so it doesn't really matter to us. And yeah, the same is true for um, any of these other registers here. Yeah, but that's actually it. It's only this very small table um, with user accessible or not even user accessible uh, registers. So yeah, we can we cannot actually look at very much here. Um, yeah, what what else have I tried so far? So you can see I tried UTVL and U status. So status would be. Um, like, yeah, th this very first register here. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we can't really use much of that. So the next thing we could look at is the uh, supervisor registers. Now the problem is when we run a binary, uh, we are not running in supervisor mode. We are running in user mode. So, um, we could do something very nasty. We could add something to the Linux kernel, uh, which would allow us to read um, any other CSR. So the thing with that is, it might be that there are also some sensitive values in those registers, or you know, if you make them writable, um, you might actually mess up the system pretty much. And well, now here comes the next culprit. Even the kernel would not be allowed to access any register. If at all, it could access those here, the supervisor registers, um, but it would not be allowed to access the machine register. So if you recall from uh, the RISC-V architecture, so we have the uh, different privilege modes. So we have the machine mode, the highest privilege. We have the supervisor mode where our Linux kernel is currently running. And then we have our user mode, which is where we just ran our little test program here. So yeah, that isn't very great. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually already uh, uh, thought about this issue. And what I did on another platform was, um, you know, in a local fork of the Linux kernel, um, I hacked something um, which would do a call to the SBI. So yeah, in, in this case here, it's open SBI, which doesn't offer it. Um, but I put something in, in our, our boot based environment. So in our SBI, um, yeah, I, I have added a few things which allowed for reading uh, very few specific registers, which were, um, you know, platform specific. Um, that's for the all winner D1 SLC. You know, they have uh, special uh, ISA extensions and stuff like that, uh, for which there are special CSRs. Um, yeah, but yeah, it would mean that we would need to uh, make changes on a few layers now, which is uh, not pretty feasible in the uh, few minutes that we have left here. Uh, but maybe that is something for another time. And maybe that is even something we could upstream so that we could do the very same thing that we can do on x86, where you know we can look at our slash dev slash CPU number and then MSR. Um, yeah, we will have to see. So yeah, what is the um, what is the last thing uh, we could do for today? Because this isn't really uh, going anywhere now, but I wanted to show it anyway. Um, I have prepared something else, and that is uh, another project which I call U Apps. So what is U Apps? First of all, let me show you uh, where this is hosted. So this is on GitHub under the organization platform system interface. It is something that I started like a year ago or something. Um, there is not much in there uh, except for what I'm currently drafting, U apps. And I'm also drafting a few standards uh, that people could adhere to, um, which you know would become important uh, in, in terms of platform security, for example, um, and auditability. Anyway, so uh, let, let's have a quick look at what U apps is. So we have this here. Um, a commands directory or CMDs actually. So there's a very common thing in Go. This is where you would put your, uh, you know, the, the commands for which you write binaries for. 
if you're coming from uh, the Rust world, um, think of it like, you know, that would be your crate where you would put your binary, so like a binary crate. Um, and then we would have something, uh, if, if, we, if we had like shared code or something, we would put that in another directory here. So uh, like in a different crate in Rust, it's just a bit different here. And what do we have in CMD? So in CMD, I've so far drafted uh, three things. Uh, one is called MSR Explorer. Um, and that is for x86 system. So on an x86 system, I can use a command now to read an MSR. I wanted to do the same thing um, on uh, RISC V, but as we already saw, so we cannot really read many of the CSRs. And I also cannot easily just, um, you know, access registers like we could do that in Rust. Uh, it's a bit different here in Go. And yeah, I mean, we could technically uh, do something um, sort of similar to inline assembly. So we, we could call into C code um, through some mechanisms, but yeah, I've, I've never already done that here in, in Go. And I don't really intend to do that. So I'm just keeping this as a draft now. Um, and there is something else I want to look at and that is called tboot. And what tboot is, is, well, first of all, just a very rough draft now. Um, but the goal is to have a bootloader uh, that we could then run in Linux boot um, to boot into an operating system. And how does this work? So, uh, you know, usually in uh, like when, when you boot up a machine, like I don't know, you buy a laptop or something um, and you don't have an operating system. So you, you would need an interface uh, which allows for, you know, booting from, I don't know, a, a network or a local storage device like a USB drive or something. Um, and this is where complexity starts now. So you need, you know, all the drivers for that and so on. That's why we use Linux and the Linux boot project. So we have those drivers. Um, and you would also need a nice application for it. So we could make a command line tool, right? So uh, and in fact, we do have command line tools. Um, so you would type a command, you would get feedback from the command, you would need to understand what you're seeing there. Um, and well, that is often very, very hard uh, and also unnecessary. So even in a terminal environment, um, we can uh, make very, very nice applications. And that is what one project is doing. Um, and that is Charm Bracelet. You might have heard about this. So yeah, they um, made a library, uh, which is you know a framework for TUI application. So what is TUI? That is short for terminal user interface. And this is also what I'm using here. So yeah, this uh, here is called Bubble T and it comes from Charm. If you go to charm.sh, you can also see what else they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to uh, do too much advertisements here or, you know, go too much into that. So we're, we're literally go going to look at this here very quickly. Uh, Bubble Tea, I personally really like it. Um, it has a very nice logo, right? But as you can see here, uh, you can do very, very rich things in your terminal now, um, which to be honest, I hadn't even expected to be possible, especially this year. This is very, very nice and this is what i want to use for creating a bootloader so let me quickly show you what i have so far i have this uh, cpu vision 5 script right so now i can just run the bootloader on my remote machine so i can use tboot rv so this is now built for risk 5 and now this here is running a tiny little menu um, it's really just that and just stupid um, and that would allow for, you know, doing a very brief setup, like, I don't know, if you want to uh, offer a Wi-Fi access point, um, that is what we can do, for example, instead of automatically booting into, uh, uh, into CPU. So like if you have a keyboard attached to the device, we could show this here on the actual screen and then allow you to, you know, do your setup as you need it. Uh, you, you could also say you're a Wi-Fi client and you want to connect to your whatever access point that is uh, connected to the internet again. Um, I know, choose the HTTP or something. I, I really just made this up. So <laughs> this is literally a copy from um, the to-do list example that we have uh, here in the Bubble Tea repo somewhere. Um, you know, there are like a, a few demos here and so on. Uh, and also other examples. 
um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, th this is what I have currently. Uh, I also took this loading spinner because I really like it. See, it's it's essentially like, I don't know if you made a spinner on your website, but it's so cool to have that in your terminal. Um, yeah, so yeah, this app isn't really uh, doing anything uh, meaningful right now. It's just showing all of this here. So yeah, essentially what I would need to add now is something like state management, right? So that, um, you know, wh whatever you select there uh, gets stored somewhere. And then I would uh, use the eventual state, like, I don't know, whatever options you choose, like I don't know, a Wi-Fi client, you may enter like an SSID, or we could also do just, you know, scanning in the background call into, uh, I don't know, the wireless tools, whatever it's called, um, do some scanning, show you a list of access points to choose from and so on, um, which would then get uh, close to what you might uh, know from network manager. So they also have a TUI, right? So this year where you can say you want to edit or activate a connection, set the system host name and so on. Yeah, we're going to have something very similar, uh, but for rich firmware setup. So yeah, instead of, you know, putting like network manager and many, many different other tools um, into the firmware image eventually. Um, yeah, I just want to have one single tool that uh, people can then use very, very easily. So yeah, now the nice part about this is um, because we're running over CPU, uh, we just need a different architecture, but I can also just draft this on my local machine. So here I'm running the same binary now directly on my local machine. I could do the very same thing. Um, and because we can also do user land emulation, I could actually also use the risk five version as you can see, uh, but I cannot use the x86 version on the remote. So this should get us an error. Yeah, exact format error. So yeah, we, we're not emulating x86 now on the um, vision five board, right? So yeah, if we look at file here, it says it's a 64-bit executable, blah de blah, uh, x86, right? The RV one would be UCB RISC V, um, UCB University of California and Berkeley, I guess, uh, because they are the ones who created RISC V. Yeah, it's a commonly abbreviated UCB. So, yeah. Um, that's it actually for today. So what I want to prepare for next time is something I haven't yet mentioned. So the, the thing was um, why I actually uh, did this here now as like an intermezzo or something. Um, we were not really getting further due to lack of documentation on the um, Vision 5 board. So that was the uh, JH7110, no, 7100 SLC, 7110 is the upcoming one. Um, and we actually have a Google group. Uh, group, 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 groups are google.com. This year um, for the dev board community. And uh, Jeff here is offering us to um, actually ask if we could get more documentation. So yeah, Jeff is writing, let's zoom in here a bit. Um, I wrote because the yeah upcoming um, JH7110, uh, I, I would ho hope that it's uh, documented better. That's what I, I wrote here. And I also wrote that is uh, that we're getting stuck on the JH7100 and Jeff is writing, if you direct mail me uh, your more details about the documentation you need, and the rationale for requesting it, I'd be more than happy to make an introduction to my contacts at star five. While I cannot commit to getting information, yeah, of course, like Robert, I have found them to be easy to work with. So yeah, let's see if that works out. Um, yeah, that would be really, really cool actually. So yeah, I will write an email to uh, Jeff and uh, yeah, hopefully we get documentation on the DRAM controller. So that was something um, or we actually don't have any documentation and the code in the repository is, you know, literally just writing arbitrary bytes to arbitrary registers. Um, so to our eyes, it's uh, like, you know, essentially like a binary. <laughs> so yeah, and on the other hand, we were, uh, you know, fiddling with the uh, different configuration registers, like, you know, where we were switching the UART from 
uh, one one pin header to another and uh, configuring uh, configuring it and stuff like that. And what we essentially had was, uh, you know, just a copy of a very large, uh, seemingly generated header file, um, just translated to Rust. And yeah, so we we could try to uh, registers defined there, but we didn't really know what the meaning of those registers and so on. So yeah, that didn't really help. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to write in this email now. Yeah, um, so uh, a very brief recap. Let's have a look at this here again. So uh, what we did today, uh, we looked at a few CSRs. I showed you one of the tools that I made for doing that, um, written in Rust, uh, which is, uh, yeah, using the RISC-V uh, crate uh, for accessing the registers. Uh, that's just the uh, risk five crate. So yeah, uh, this is now my fork up here. Otherwise, you would find it under Rust embedded slash risk five, um, or you just you know put risk five in your cargo tomo file. So yeah, the current version is 080. Yeah, uh, we were running. Um, this via CPU and CPU is running in a Linux boot environment. Uh, we were serving a kernel for that using the center tool from Harvey OS. And yeah, that automatically just spun up the CPU daemon for us. And then we could just run uh, whatever commands we wanted, like the ls command, the cat command, and so on. Yeah, and we can still read out the temperature. As you can see, it's, um, you know, fairly stable. It's not much above 50 degrees. So yeah, we were at around 50 uh, in the beginning. So yeah, I'm now going to turn off the machine um, and end the stream. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much. And see you again another time. Bye.